Welcome, moms. It's really, really good to be here again. Um, I had thought about not doing this Friday because it's so close to the to the Christmas holiday, but I'm really glad that um, that we decided to go ahead and do it. So it's nice to be with all of you today. Um, we have some. We have we have a friend of Melissa's on who's new. Kira, welcome, Kira. It's really good to have you. And we're gonna see what else happens this morning. We have another couple of moms who had were, had expressed an interest interest in trying to get on this morning. So we'll see what happens, see if they get that opportunity or not. Sometimes things come up. I know we're missing Laura today because she's got sick children. So Rachel, it's good to have you with us. So good to have you with us. Um, Rachel Stevens is the is the mom who does the We Heart Share a couple of times a month where you get to invite your kids, your family, and share some of the things that you're doing, some talents, some experiences, hobbies, whatever. So that's really fun. I love that that brings families together. I think that's such a wonderful thing that you're doing, Rachel. Uh, okay, so moms, are there some things that you're thinking about? Some feelings, some experiences, anything that you've been, um, that has been going on with you that you want to share as we get going this morning. And don't, don't worry about the silence that doesn't, we are comfortable with silence. We know that gives us time to think, some quiet time to think. Hey, Lindsay. Oh, it is cold in this room. <laughs> you guys that live in the snow, what is it the temperature of your houses? What, what do you, what, how warm do you keep your houses? I'm just curious. Anybody want to share? Such a silly thing, but I'm curious. It doesn't have to be snow right now, but just snowy. Oh, 68, 70 to 72. Oh, oh. Nice. I think I'm 62 upstairs right now. <laughs> it's so cold. We try to do one floor or the other, you know, wherever we're going to be mostly. We try to cool or heat that. So anyway, 70 to 71 in the winter, 73 to 75 in the summer. Oh, man. I need to turn my heater up. I've been spending time down by the fireplace because that's nice and toasty, but we have no burn days. Does anybody else have no burn days where you live? Is that a common thing or is it just a California thing? Arizona has no burn days. I mean, we definitely do. I have to confess, I'd never look. If we say that if you want to know whether it's a burn day or not, just check our fireplace and see if there's a fire or not. Then it's a burn day. <laughs> but that's not really. Oh, nice, Melissa. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Okay, so and then my friend Melissa won't be joining us today. She's getting ready to go to lunch with another friend of mine. That they, they got together and I'm excited about that. Melissa, did you get a haircut? Yep. Finally. Cute. <laughs> cute, cute, cute. No, why finally? Do you not usually have it that long on top? This is after I cut it, I cut it really short because it grows out so fast and I don't like getting my hair cut. So <laughs> I go from really short to unruly really fast. No, I don't think it was unruly, but okay, good to know. Okay, moms. Um, I had oh, a go good, good. Go ahead, Melissa. Um, I saw something, I think it was on like a preparedness page online or something. I don't know if anyone shared it on Well Educated Heart, but they shared that there was a volcanic eruption in Spain and at some point, and there were like a hundred beekeepers on this island that evacuated. And a beekeeper came back after like two months being gone from his hives. And five of his six hives had survived the volcanic eruption. Um, because even though the hives were buried in ash, they had survived when everything started happening. The bees had sealed all the cracks in the hive with one of their products, I don't know, and eaten their honey. They'd survived on the food that they had stored. And five of the six hives that were like 
I think it said like 600 meters from the volcano, volcano had survived. And that made me think of like our families and our homes and, and there are times, I mean, bees live by going out in the world. That's, their, <laughs> that's how they live is by going out in the world. But when it came to it, they were able to totally insulate and survive on what they had in their homes. That's very cool. I like that analogy, you know, whether it's physical or spiritual or a combination of both, that is really beautiful. So and I just thought that was really cool. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That is really cool. And we really are kind of getting down to that time where that idea of us being prepared is probably pretty important. Not just kind of, oh, I'll, I'll think about that and work on that some years from now, you know, but <laughs> probably. Yeah, okay. like, what do I need? Like, even though we're going out into the world, what do I need to be able to sustain it at home if needs be? Yeah, that's a really good idea. That would be a great family home evening lesson, a great family council discussion. Really good for us to kind of maybe start off a list in a journal, to start thinking about what are the things, physical and spiritual, temporal and spiritual. Oh, I love yeah. it, Melissa. Thanks for sharing that. Rachel, Maybe. are you coming on? Oh. <laughs> yeah um sorry I'm like in my bathroom doing my makeup but <laughs> finally getting ready for the day that's um, right I was just you guys were talking about pre preparation and I was just thinking about I read a quote by President Nelson last night about how we need to take you know was it like extreme I, don't know. I need to pull oh. it up um, it was from this last conference. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's a word that was like something, things that were completely different. What's the word? Was it extraordinary? Yes, extraordinary measures. Mm -hmm. Yes, take extraordinary measures. And um, before I read that quote, I was listening to a podcast, uh, the Follow Him podcast, and they're talking about how this lady, like every year she's studied like, each book of scripture for the whole entire year, she studies every one of them. And then she does it all again the next year. And I was just thinking about like, just, you know, spiritual preparation, being close to God and really knowing, knowing the scriptures and knowing his words. And so anyway, that was my thought. So I like it. I like it. That's good. And when they, when we get words thrown in like that, it makes us kind of think about it. Okay. So what's, How's that different? What would be, you know, extraordinary or whatever, you know, the word is, what would, what would that look like for me? How will that be different? Cause that's obviously something different, something more. And what would that be? Also remember if at all possible for you to turn your screens on, please turn your screens on. Cause we love to see your faces. Okay, any other thoughts on, along those lines or anything else that you've been thinking about recently that's just on your mind, experiences you've been having? Remember so often, just that little thing that you think is so insignificant turns out to be really important. So this is not, on the preparation topic, although my comment on that would be during the whole shutdown and things when you're thinking, oh man, I'm not prepared like I thought, but it's funny how simple it really can be. When you're thinking preparation, like the prophets and all of them are talking, you're thinking you're supplied and you're thinking big picture. When we were in the lockdown, we didn't know how long we were going to be there, you know, and then mm -hmm. I realized, wow, okay, I'm a little more prepared than I gave myself credit because I didn't have to struggle about getting to the store to buy things because I had prepared myself to know how to make certain things with ingredients I had at home. So you have to give yourself credit for just preparing yourself with knowledge to do things that you would normally pay for. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so just having that like, came to my mind of just teach yourself new things teach yourself how to make bread so you don't have to worry about paying for it 
or things along those lines. Anyway, um, my thing was, so I'm revamping my, it's my formal dining room, but I don't, I'm turning in, I wanted to turn it into my library, kind of like jewelry. <laughs> and I have a piano in there that my husband bought for me when we moved into this house and it's, it smells like old lady in smoke and it's out of tune. <laughs> and I, I was like, well, you know, it's going to take me like $300 to refinish it and then have it tuned and everything. It's just not worth it. I'd rather spend that money and dump it into some bookcases. And I'm the only one that plays in our home. And so I thought, oh, it's not such a big sacrifice. It's just me. Well, when I started laying out my plans for the room and telling my kids what I wanted to do with that room, they both got ticked off that I was willing to sell that piano. And I play it <laughs> maybe once every four months, maybe, you know, and they were so mad that I would even consider getting rid of that. Even if it's just an ornamental piece sitting in my room right now. And so this morning I was like, you know what? I'm going to play then. If you guys are so mad that I'm willing to get rid of it, I'm going to put it to you. So I started playing it and I play horribly and within minutes, they were both in the room going, okay, play this, play that mom. Can I have a turn? Mom, can I do this? And I thought, okay, if I'm the only one that's playing it, but yet they're the ones that mad about it, I need to make sure I am playing it so that it kind of encourages them to maybe try a little harder and they like having the music in the house. And as I was playing, I thought it is nice being able to play the music and not have to go push a button on a radio and listen to Spotify or something like that. I can do it myself. And it kind of came along those lines of teach yourself how to make bread. It's teach mm -hmm. yourself how to make the music instead of, you know, but I just thought it was funny that they were so mad about it, but well, I think that's so sweet. I love that. Obviously, it does have a significant meaning for them. You know, that's important for them. Ida, you're going to say something. Was it on here that we talked about, or was it, maybe it was just on the Facebook thread, that when music is uh, digitized, that it, the the rhythms in it are, are like uh, something. Something's messed up with the music. It doesn't doesn't have the same effect on you. So when you actually play the piano, instead of listening to music on the radio or the TV or your phone or whatever, the impact that it has on your you at, to help you to feel that peace and that uplift that comes with the music is so much different. So it's so powerful. And I'm so glad that your kids were ticked because I'm like, no, don't get rid of the piano. Sorry, that's just my personal opinion. Don't mind me. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. You, you guys need to to make sure that you pass all of your ideas, plans for renovating and everything by this group first before you do it. Because <laughs> we're definitely going to have opinions. <laughs> it was Marlene that shared that. She was talking about it in regards to her, like when she was learning to harp and somebody in her class told her. So I was like, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was interesting too. Go ahead, Ida. Sorry. I'm done. That's it. <laughs> love it, Lindsay. That was great. <laughs> And you have no idea what's going to happen with your kids and the possibility of their playing. You should hear um, Lindsay Bunting's son, Max, her little Max, the, you know, the one with all the energy. Um, he has started taking piano lessons with my Sarah and he's very talented musically. He is picking it up so fast and there are things he's understanding that are pretty impressive. Sarah's very impressed with him you know and as they're playing along and he's just learning the scale you know he's humming along with it and perfect perfect pitch i mean i'm not saying he has perfect pitch i don't know that but right now as he's doing that his pitch is right on and that's from his grandpa his grandpa sings and i don't know if there are other people in lindsay's family too but anyway it's just fun to to hear him and see that excitement and then anyway Lindsay's daughter is playing and Laura's kids are playing and it's um, it's fun to hear them come as they come over for their lessons and hear the progress and just, you know, it's fun to watch that transition from when they're just going along in their little piano books and then when they get to play a song and they recognize it as a song, you know, and then when they get to pick one that they love and 
all that just come alive and it, it you go through some years that are sometimes a little bit painful as you're listening to them practice those songs over and over and over and over again but then the reward is so sweet i just i got a um I got a little um, message the other day and a little link to a to some files that m made me all teary. I was sitting in front of the fireplace and all of a sudden my phone dings, you know, and there's this little file attached, you know, for mom. And I open it up and it, um, Michael, while he had been waiting for his companion at a church building, recorded a bunch of the Christmas songs that he plays around the house every year for me and then sent me the files. So it, of course, you know, I'm all sappy and everything. So I, I'm crying as I'm listening to the recordings of Michael playing all these Christmas songs, but it was so sweet. There's such, such beauty and such meaning for a mom, you know, as you're listening to your kids bringing music into your home. That's just another little byproduct. But Lindsay, I love that you play and I love that you, that your thought was, okay, I need to play more because that's not just going to be good for your kids it's going to be good for you it's going to be good for your heart so i love that so there's going to be room in the library for a piano apparently <laughs> good 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 also know that lately there have been so many pianos for sale on you know craigslist offer up whatever people are dumping their pianos because they're not playing and um Oh gosh, and there have been some really beautiful ones that have come up lately and good um, good brands that have really nice, really nice sounds. So you can keep your eye out for that too because maybe you just want to invest in a new piano. I mean, it was like a couple hundred dollars. So I was very, very impressed. Go ahead, Ida. Um, just a side note, we have a piano in our library too, Lindsay, and it's amazing. <laughs> Except for my kids all like to pretend to play and sometimes that makes me crazy, but it's okay. It's good. I actually have a basket full of instruments, like just random little instruments, bells and things, and I like stick them in the library. But we made this little space in our house to be a library and my brother came over, he was visiting from Washington. He's like, interesting, does it get used? And I was like, kind of a little bit defensive, like, of course it does. But then I was thinking about it and actually, it really does. I have some cozy chairs in there, a nice rug, and the kids come in there and they're reading all the time and I love it. And it's just amazing just creating that space, how much it just, it's inviting, you know? And so they are always sitting over the reading books and I'm like, yes, my plan has worked. <laughs> so I think that's really cool. Yeah. Well, I remember years and years ago talking to Kathy Brown in my um, living room and she was determined to keep the school thing going. She had the school desks all lined up in her school room and the map on the wall and the, you know, all the different things, um, the letters going across the top. I mean, I did that too. I did that too in the beginning, all that stuff. And she, you know, that she was just determined. And I said, you know, just trust me on this, take the school desks out, take them out, bring in bookcases, bring in baskets of books, uh, picture books, bring in um, a comfy sofa or a love seat or chair or whatever you can afford and a bunch of pillows and just see what happens. Don't ask them to do anything. Don't give them any assignments. Just watch and see what happens. And she was just, Lindsay probably remembers, she was just fighting that. She was just like, no, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Anyway, she finally did it and it just completely changed her world. And now, you know, Kathy has spent a couple of years in an RV with her family, traveling across the country, just doing school as they go. And, you know, it's just a hundred percent different difference, but they, our kids love that. They gravitate toward things that they love if they're given the opportunity. And so do we, so do we, we need that too. We need the opportunity for us to create, for us to be, for us to find our, you know, our things that we love and our things that make us happy. I loved watching Ida, the transformation from, nope, nope, we don't paint, that's messy. You know, I'm not gonna get my paints out because my kids will just make a mess with them, which I totally understand, absolutely, you know. But then when you made that shift, that mind shift, and then decided, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna get the stuff out. You know, what a difference that made. I love the comments over here. You know, we, Lindsay loves the basket full of in instruments. We have, a, we had a bin. Well, we still have it. We bring it out when cousins come over 
And the kids love that. The big kids love it too. Harmonicas, yes. Rachel, that's a really good idea. Um, also, those little kalimbas. I've been, I want a kalimba for Christmas, <laughs> like Santa. Um, my kids flock to the boom whackers. Oh, I've always wanted those too. Drumsticks, kazoos, and bells. Any of you have the, um, oh, you do, Lindsay? Oh. Yeah, we have all sorts of stuff. So I always just buy it. It's there. So we have bells, we have violins, we have the kalimba, we have the piano, we have like, it's all like, a, yeah, just like in a stack next to the piano. Like, just pull it out, play with it. Oh, ukuleles. Yeah, it's fun. Cause you never know, like they just randomly will pull a ukulele out and be like, I think I'll just mess around with it. Like I'll tune it. They really just like to tune them over and over again. <laughs> But I don't know, it's just something to explore. It's just there. And the bells are super fun because there's videos on YouTube. So I love right. the bells, especially Christmas time. There's so many Christmas videos with the bells. So, and my kids and Laura's kids like to get together and do that because then they have lots of people to do the bells. <laughs> right. I love, we do the bells on um, we music. <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> Our little we, you know, anyway, we do, we do that. And Beatles Rock Band. We play Beatles Rock Band. But I love it. Go ahead, Ida. Um, I had, uh, I was, I was thinking about that because um, that doesn't make any sense. Let me start over. <laughs> I was uh, talking to Lori in another, um, Marco Polo. She was, sent me a message. She was, reminded me to have music to have play music and then I was like realizing that I was doing that for a long time I was really consistently like turning on classical music or something during the day and just quietly I'd put it on like the tv or something so everybody could kind of hear it but it wasn't like overbearing and then we were doing art and we were um uh spending time going out into nature and kind of like Thanksgiving like everything just fell off the wagon and I was like so she said something about that. And I'm like, oh, I haven't done any art. I haven't done any music. We haven't really been outside. We've been trying to do some other stuff and it has been working out. And I was like, I feel like it's, and, and it's funny cause I can totally feel like a difference. Like the kids are just like a little bit more angst, have like energy, like they're just like, ah, you know, I need to do something. And um, to get out that like creative energy and just also to be able to like, the way that that brings peace into our home and um just a, like more flow it's really interesting so i was thinking about that the last day or so since lori mentioned it and i was like yeah i need to be doing that and i feel like we have story time but that's hard for my girls because they don't really understand and we do a little bit of like reading of bulgarian like the scriptures and stuff in english but just the other things too really add a, a huge element of like just peace and calm. And so last night I was like, okay, I turned on, we had dinner and I turned on some classical, mu some Christmas music and we put the candles on the table and we just ate and it was so awesome. Like everything was calm for just a few minutes and it was great for my husband because he's been stressed out. So I was like, okay, I need to be doing this more. <laughs> anyways and it helped everybody else too it was really good so just just inviting those things into your home is so powerful making opportunities for your kids to experience them i love it Lindsay. are you coming on to say something or are you just reading Oh, I was going to say something, but I was like, oh, what did you say? I don't want to go on until, no. until I read what you said. So I didn't read it. Um, yeah, what did you say? I just <laughs> said, dear, moms, do yourselves a big giant favor and make sure you bring music, art, nature, stories, even poetry in your days. It really does make things so much better. Simple answer. Yeah. So I've had the same thought that I was having the last couple of days. And that's kind of what I came to like to today with like that was the thought on my mind is like it's funny how we like are really good about doing those things they just happen naturally almost and then it just like goes away and then you're like wait a minute how did it go away and you gotta like bring it back it's just so weird because you definitely can feel a difference you're like what is going on in our house and you're like oh yeah forgot to do those things 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's just funny how it comes and goes. But then also, sometimes you expect those things to like make everything just magical. Like, okay, we're going to go on a nature walk and it'll just be like so nice. Like everyone will just be so happy. Yeah, ebb and flow. That's like, I feel like this is the story of our lives, right? Like up and down, up and down. But um, this morning we went on a nature walk and just me and my two little ones. And I was like, oh, this is just so lovely. And it's foggy outside and we're all bundled up. And then somebody got mad about something. And like, I just felt like the whole walk was ruined. And I just thought, like, my heart was broken. Like, why? Like, why? Why can't it just be like beautiful and just perfect? <laughs> So I just thought, okay, what can I learn from this? So I was just like, Heavenly Father, what am I supposed to learn from this lesson right here? Like, why am I doing the beautiful things and it's just not beautiful? But it just, I got that like answer that like we have agency. It was just kind of a lesson and like that's how he feels about us when we're not doing the things that he wants us to do. <laughs> like it breaks his heart too. He's like, come on, like just be happy. Can't you just be happy? Because that's how I was feeling about my child. I'm like, can't you just be happy and enjoy the things around you? And then I, I realized that's how Heavenly Father feels about us. I'm like, can't you just be happy? Look at all these things I gave you. Can't you just enjoy them all and just be happy? But anyway, so I thought, okay, I can learn something from that too. Because it's not always just beautiful. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little messy, even when we're doing those things. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. And so many times this past week, as I've been looking at things to discuss this week, I kept going to things for our children. And we don't usually do that a whole bunch here. We try to talk about what's for the moms, right? And so I was thinking, why am I going to the children? Why am I going to the children? And then as I was praying about it, thinking about it more, it was that it's the same message. It's the same message. The same things are true. The same principles work. So that's really interesting that, of course, this conversation goes this way. And what Lindsay just said is true. You take those things that you think as you're interacting with your child, and then you turn that to you and your relationship with Heavenly Father. That's the same thing. Ida? Um, I kind of, I've been thinking about that same sort of thing too, Lindsay, because it was like, you know, some days are really hard. <laughs> and I know that what we're doing in our family is what we're supposed to be doing, right? But some days I'm just like, and my husband has felt that heaviness a little bit, like, this is crazy. <laughs> and I was listening to this talk from conference about, um, it, I don't remember even the title of the talk. Deepening our conversion to Jesus Christ is the title. But anyways, he, he talks about Nephi in there. And when Nephi was going to get the brass plates, he was going to get the scriptures and Heavenly Father commanded him to do that, right? And so you'd think here he is being faithful, going off to do the thing he's asked to do. It should be magical, right? Everything should be great. No problems. He got like Laban tried to kill him. He had all of his stuff robbed. Like then his brothers beat him up. Like all these really <laughs> awful things happened. And here he was trying to do the thing like get the scriptures so he could like read them to his kids like this is an important thing that he was doing and there was all these challenges and the lord was with him but it was still so hard sometimes and i'm sure he had moments where he, like he doesn't say it but maybe he just wanted to be like i'm going home i'm done this is just not fun i mean layman and lemuel sure felt that way <laughs> so i think like that's like <laughs> i love that Lindsay. <laughs> um that's how it is sometimes you know we have to remember like just because Heavenly father is telling us to do these things and they're important and we don't know what's happening like there was growth that happened for nephi and maybe for sam you know too like being able to be see things or whatever and experience some of the challenges too like that they were able to grow their faith and other things too and so even on the walk like our last hike that we took too same thing like it was really beautiful. We went and saw this waterfall. It was so great. And it was, but it was kind of long. And like the kids are complaining. And somebody got hurt. Somebody was angry. And by the time we got to the van, I was like, ah, <laughs> this is supposed to be peaceful. <laughs> and that wasn't feeling very peaceful. And so I think, you know, just remembering that, like, 
just because we're doing the right thing, it's not going to be easy for sure. Everybody, I mean, we all feel that, but <laughs> yeah, just, just remember Nephi. <laughs> no, that's so good. Go ahead, Lindsay. In fact, I've thought about that a lot, like related to basketball. When you're doing it right, it's hard. Like when you're running your drills the right way, like it's hard. And so I think a lot of times it's harder Mommy. when we are, hold on, when we are doing the right thing, like you get more resist. I don't know. I've always thought about that too. Like just because we're doing the right thing, it's not easy. In fact, it's probably going to be hard. Yeah. yeah, I really like that. And I think like life, like at the end of your day, you look back at your day and you try to find those little gems, those positive moments. I think you can do that in these things that you plan with your kids too. <laughs> you can look and find those, those few moments when people were engaged, they were having a good time, things were going well, or it was peaceful or whatever it was that you were, you know, finding in there that was valuable. Just look for those and count it good because that's how life is. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I know. That's so true. Satan has to send more of his minions to discourage you from doing the right thing. So true. And you know what I love about that story about Nephi going to get the plates is that um, three times, three attempts, right? First time he just goes and asks for him. The second time he thinks, man, you know, him, man, he thinks using his own power, his own right ideas. Okay. I know what we'll do. We'll take a bunch of our riches. We'll go and offer those and see if we can trade them, you know, for the plates. Okay. Well, that doesn't work. Third time. What does he do the third time? That's different from all the other times. He involves God. He asks what, what, you know, and listens to the spirit and is directed. And then what do you know? Not easy, still not easy, but a, but a path is laid before him and he doesn't know beforehand what he's going to do, you know, but he follows the spirit and even labors with what he needs to do to accomplish it. And it's a super hard thing, something he's never ever done before in his life, but it's, it's still the right thing and he does it and he accomplishes the task. So I think that's really a cool part about that story too. Probably a lesson in there for us about listening and following the spirit and doing it in those ways. And that's hard too, because we sometimes forget to include that part. Man, it goes better when we do. So I brought a book. This is a book. I talk about it kind of a lot, but I really love it. It's called Hints on Child Training. And it's the one that's the very old child training book that was written in like mid 1850s by a man. Super interesting, but beautiful. Talks about will, will training rather than will breaking, which was more common in those days. Anyway, so it's just beautiful. And this is the one that has the chapter second to the last that talks about um, giving added value to a child's Christmas and making it magical. I love that. But the last chapter is called Good Night Words. And it talks about how important it is for your children to hear something positive at nighttime before they head off to bed so that the last message they hear from their parents is something po positive. The last thoughts that they have are something positive. Well, my goodness, what is a harder time of day <laughs> than nighttime when you're trying to get your kids to bed and they don't want to go because they want to hang out with you, right? So that whole idea is fodder for guilt ridden moms, right? You know, that whole, <laughs> that whole idea in that chapter, but it's beautiful. It's so beautiful if you look at it as just what are what are some of the things that can be encouraging? What are some of the things you can do that are positive? But as I was thinking about how important this is, and I was reading this whole chapter last night, I was just sitting by the fire reading this, and um, it says, this is the golden hour for good impressions on the children's heart. That is the parent's choicest opportunity of holy influence. I love that. I love this whole idea as it relates to children. But then given the message that I received from Heavenly Father this week about what I was turning to, okay, so how can I apply this to me? How can we apply this to us? What do we need right before we go to bed at night? What kind of a message do we need to receive before we lie down and put our heads on the pillow <laughs> and go to sleep? And I thought, okay, okay, so I need some nice good night words 
as I'm drifting off to sleep. There's so many things to go from here. So many things, you know, maybe your prayer, what you listen to before you go to bed, maybe meditation, things that are positive, right? Like that, right? Also your relationship with your spouse, the importance of really working on that, really nurturing that relationship so that there are, you know, lovely good nights, you know, um, as you're before your head hits the pillow, you know, between the two of you, I mean, just lots and lots of things, but I loved this idea that that was, a, a, a very kind of a sacred time that, that before we go to sleep is important. Um, and here's another one. I just loved, loved this. It also talks about the relationship between parent and child, heavenly father and child, which we're already talking about. So I think this is significant and I'm going to share this with you. It says, um, okay, so this was a father and son. Um, talked about a very sensitive, timid little boy and the, the how, how the good nights went at nighttime. Um, after loving good night words and kisses had been given him by both his parents and he had nestled down to rest, this little boy was accustomed night after night to rouse up once more and to call out from his trundle bed to his strong armed father in the room from which the light gleamed out beyond the shadowy hallway. Are you there, Papa? And the answer would come back cheerily. Yes, my child, I am here. You'll take care of me tonight, Papa, won't you? Was then his question. Yes. I'll take care of you, my child, was the comforting response. Go to sleep now. Good night. And the little fellow would fall asleep restfully in the thought of those assuring good night words. A little matter that was to the loving father, but it was a great matter to the sensitive son. It helped to shape the son's life. It gave the father an added hold on him. And it opened up the way for his clearer understanding of his dependence on the loving watch watchfulness of the all father and to this day when that son himself a father and a grandfather now lies down to sleep at night he is accustomed out of the memories of that lesson of long ago to look up through the shadows of his earthly sleeping place into the far off light of his father's presence meaning heavenly father and to call out in that same spirit of childlike trust and helplessness of so long ago father You'll take care of me tonight, won't you? And he hears the assuring answer back. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. The Lord shall keep thee from all evil. He shall keep thy soul. Sleep, my child, in peace. And so he realizes the twofold blessing of a father's good night words. I love that. I love how our parenting gives us so many opportunities to better understand our relationship with our Heavenly Father and with the Savior. And I think there are lessons for us in every single day throughout the day. Not to feel guilty, that's Satan's path, you know. Any of the things that come your way, especially this Christmas season, you know, I'm hearing guilt from moms, not so much here, but a little bit. Um, but um but out you know out in the world don't don't give into that just let it go just let that go and find what are the lessons for me what are the things that i that i can learn here what are the things that i need any thoughts <clears throat> oh cassie you're so 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 sweet how beautiful it reminds me of a post i came across and the mom shared her child's drawing she said he drew safe and it was a drawing of the child in the middle of a bed with his parents on either side. Thanks, Cassie, for sharing that. I just think it's funny because I have one kid <laughs> that does not like to go to bed at night. She's she's and it's funny because I'm like, you're 10 years old, but she will still just come crawl in our bed. I want to just hang out or she'll ask for, can you just come lay in my bed with me for five minutes? And sometimes I'm human and I say, no, go away. <laughs> and other times I try not to be so human and I'll go sit with her and she'll tell me about which 
I know it's not, she'll tell me about the dumbest stuff, but it's, that's what's on her heart and that's what's bugging her. And all she wanted to do is just get it off her mind so she could go to sleep because I have so much dumb stuff on my mind mm -hmm. that keeps me awake at night. And so it, and that's what it is. It's just frivolous stuff. And, but instead of taking those five minutes to let her just offload it, sometimes it turns into like an hour and a half battle of just going to bed and right. You know, it's why do we make it harder? And sometimes it's just come lay with me for five minutes and she won't say anything. She just needs me there. And then she'll go right to sleep. And those moments that I sit there and go, okay, I'm glad I took these five minutes because there's going to come time where she doesn't want me to come lay with her and uh -huh. just be there or listen to her list of things that are bugging her, you know, and I, I want to be the parent that takes the five minutes instead of fighting for an hour and a half, because I would hope that my heavenly father is the parent that takes those five minutes. Right. So. No, I think it's, I just think this is such a beautiful idea to think about a beautiful thing. Um, I'm really glad you shared that, Lindsay, because that's really important for us to offload the stuff that we're thinking of. So why not for them too, right? Um, this says, suggests that um, the last waking thoughts of a child have a peculiar power over his mind and heart and are influential in fixing his impressions and in shaping his character for all time. When he turns from play and playmates and leaves the busy occupations of his little world to lie down by himself to sleep, a child has a sense of loneliness and dependence, which he does not feel at another time. Then he craves sympathy. He appreciates kindness. He is grieved by harshness or cold neglect. How glad a true child is to kneel by his mother's knee to pray his evening prayer or to have his father kneel with him as he prays. How he enjoys words of approval or encouragement when they perceive the goodnight kiss from either parent. With that warm and grateful affection, his young heart glows as he feels the tender impress of his mother's hand or lips upon his forehead before he drops asleep. How bright and dear to him that home seems at such an hour. How sorry he is for every word or act of unkindness which he then recalls from his conduct of the day. How ready he then is to confess his specific acts of misdoing and all his remembered failures and to make new resolves and purposes of better doing for the future. Oh, 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 oh. Whatever else a child is impatient to grow away from, he does not readily outgrow the enjoyment of his mother's good night. As long as she is willing to visit his bedside and give him a kiss with a loving word just before he goes to sleep, he is sure to count that privilege of his home as something above price and without which he would have a sense of sad lack. And at no time is he more sure than, than then to be ready to do whatever his mother would ask of him. At no time do gentle, tender words of loving counsel from her sink deeper into his heart or make an impression more abiding and influential. There are young men and women still at their childhood's home who look for their mother's coming to give them her goodnight kiss with no less of interest and grateful affection than when they were little boys and girls. And I just, oh gosh, um, the night before Michael left on his mission, you know, to, to go to uh, get on that plane and leave, he said, mom, can you just come lie down with me? You know? And so I did, I just, you know, curled up next to him and, um, and that was, I ended up just sleeping there, you know, and it was the sweetest thing. And for him, after I read that chapter, I thought, you know, he's not too big for that. And that's, a, I think, a very sweet memory for him, too. And our my kids, when they come home, I still, I come in and I guess them good night. And, and uh, I don't know, I just think that's really a sweet thing for us to remember as moms, that we have that kind of power. And yes, we're exhausted. And yes, we just want them to stop getting up or stop asking for things and go to sleep. So we have a little bit of time. But it's, it, it doesn't it sound like it's worth it to make that sacrifice to um, be a little more tender and a little more patient and, you know, remember those 
remember how they might be seeing the nighttime and seeing that that opportunity of sharing with you. And yes, Rachel, that's such a sweet and tender book. Love you forever. That's got such a sweet message. But then turn it to you with Heavenly Father. And don't you need that too? Don't you want to go to bed wrapped in those arms? And having that reassurance that even though you made some mistakes during that day, you know, even, you know, you, and you feel that you feel more tender and you want to share, you want to express your, you know, your sadness for not doing as well as you hoped that you would. You want to express your love and you want to be able to go to sleep knowing and being reassured that he loves you and that it's okay. And that, you know, he knows that you'll do better tomorrow. I don't know. Anyway, I just love these thoughts that parenting can give us this wonderful, better, higher relationship with our Heavenly Father. I'm sorry, I'm talking so much today. <clears throat> okay, Lindsay, is that your nephew? He's a yes. baby. He just got dropped off, so I got distracted oh. there for a minute. Ruby, you get to hang out with your cousin. Just born. Well, and he's zero. He's like three months old. Yeah. Yeah. But not a year, huh? He's zero years. Yeah. He's still zero. Uh, <laughs> that's yeah. exciting. I know. I love it. Uh, there is nothing like being with a new baby. Oh, I know. April. I'm like in full on like aunt mode because we don't have babies around here anymore. And now my brother and sister are having babies. and. I just like soaking it all up. I love it. <laughs> and I love it. it. You love it too, Ruby. Yeah. I'm glad. Yes. <laughs> but this, I love that you brought up this nighttime thing because that was on my heart last night. Because I, yeah, I took the time and I saw such a difference and staying up, even though it was late, I'm like, you guys really need to go to bed. But instead of just being like, okay, just go to sleep. I don't care if you're tired. Like, just go to sleep. I sat in there and I stayed up my two oldest ones who were awake and we talked for a long time and um last night talked about those books and then um I don't know just sat there and talked and talked and talked and then my husband wasn't home so then my oldest came in and she's like can I sleep with you so same lines you're talking about and I was like and when I woke really? up I was really scared in the and then morning you, and then you came and got in bed with us and just all cuddled up in bed and yeah it was fun so then I just, we went on a walk then we come home then we stay right. for a little then <laughs> I'm glad went. Rachel has we heart shares we really need to get on those more my kids have so much to say <laughs> yeah those are so good for that because the kids want to get on too because we're on here talking they want to be part that's awesome oh, any other thoughts on any of this moms or anything else that you're thinking about i just i love this time of year i love that we get to focus on the savior i hope you're able to do that i'm reading some posts on well-educated heart about these moms that are just just not having any time to make that happen. Other moms who are, who have kind of let go of some of the long list of, of required things and actually enjoying a little bit more of the Christ part of Christmas. So play music, that's an easy thing. Just put some music on. That is one of the easiest things you can do, and it makes such a big difference. When I was talking to Ida about it the other day, I was just quoting that silly phrase, you know, music soothes the savage beast, but it does. And some of us do have savage beasts living amongst us. <laughs> and sometimes it's us, <laughs> sometimes it's our kids. But putting some music on, put on, put on what you love. Um, but gosh, go to Rachel's list of things. Rachel, I don't know where we need to just follow you on Spotify. Rachel has so many good ideas and lists of music. Um, I loved, I just love going to the, um, the list that you recommend. And I love classical music. So if any of you want um, suggestions for classical music lists or jazz, I love soft jazz stuff. Um, I love Latin 
jazz that is my absolute favorite my son and his wife and the little baby they sent me a picture of them standing next to the statue statue of tom hobim antonio carlos hobim who's the famous brazilian jazz artist anyway and that's he's my favorite so <laughs> it's just funny that they did that but put on what you love earth wind and fire that's another thing for me i mean just goofy things but put it on put it on whether you need it for like dance you know dance background music or if you need it just for calming everybody you need it just to bring on some happy you know whatever it is put some music on it really can make a difference and that's a simple easy fix and then go on to some of the other things that you can add in that help bring that beauty and warmth to you your heart it just we forget we forget, we forget, we forget. We think that we are trying to manage all the little people. No, we're trying to manage us. Once we get us right, then everything else gets better. It's not easy. It doesn't get perfect, but it gets better and it becomes manageable. Okay, I love Rachel shared. I really love watching this video. So she shared a YouTube video. So ladies, if you can copy that so that you can, um, so that you can get that and go to that and see Robert D. Hales on parenting. That sounds wonderful. Rachel, thank you. And then Lindsay, every time I put on classical, my daughter starts dancing ballet. It opens her soul. I love it. I've had some really good experiences these last two weeks with Laura's daughter, Madeline, who I'm mentoring. And she comes over once a week and we go over what she's doing. And I give her some, like a little mini lesson and an, an assignment and I got her listening to classical music and we did a bunch of different things, listened to a bunch of different things, but it was funny, fun, really fun. And, and um, this week she just mastered, she mastered a, something on it with her piano teacher, my daughter, and they had set this goal and she would get a, Madeline would get a piano book, a new piano book from Sarah when she reached this goal and she chose a classical music book. So yes, <laughs> that was a little win. But um, anyway, it's just wonderful to be able to fill your soul with these things so that they impact you and everybody around you. Don't you notice it in your friends here? When your friends get on and share something that they love, you just sense that that excitement and beauty and them, you know, being filled. And your family does the same thing with you. They feel that from you. Anyway, this went by so fast. It's because I was talking so much. Kira, did you enjoy your time here? It's good to see you. Uh, yeah, I have also had a quick thought. I don't know yeah, if we have time to share. Yeah, to great. Go ahead. Much, but, and Go this ahead. is my daughter, Geneva. She's two months. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've actually been struggling with bedtime a lot. And when you, I teared up a little bit when you shared that story about um, the boy saying, Papa, are you there? Um, and then the Papa saying, yes, I am. Cause I feel like I would scream back, no, go to bed, <laughs> you know? And it really touched my heart to think about being more tender at, at bedtime. And um, I've been really thinking about like finding joy in the journey or also like, like recognizing small wins and finding joy in the process. I'm a runner, so I like, I'm going to be training for a marathon and sometimes a marathon can take six months to a year to prepare for. Um, and you know, it's hard not to be like, Oh, it's a year away. It's so hard, but like trying to find joy in the, your training for that day. Um, and so I thought I connected that back to bedtime of sometimes we go through the day and we let every little thing build and build and build. And then we get to bedtime and what should be a joyous, peaceful time is okay, go to bed because I need to manage myself and my emotions. And so it made me think, you know, what if I stopped throughout the day and I played music or I did a poem or I said, wow, I've really let my anger build and I'm going to stop and we're going to have a dance party before we do bedtime routine, because then I'm managing myself and I'm I'm allowed to say, I'm going to have like stop and find joy in this moment so that when I get to bedtime, I don't have to only have my joy at night. I can find joy throughout the day. So there's just a thought. And so thanks for letting me share. And yeah, I've, I really enjoyed the meeting. Thanks, Melissa, um, for inviting me. I'm so glad you came, Kira. And I'm so glad you shared that. That's really beautiful. And that is 
that's a great way to think about it that as we go throughout the day we need to nurture our hearts a little bit along the way right so that we don't get to the end of the day and are tapped out so it'd be good to put in those heartwarming activities throughout your day and then i just added on there couple of things, this mother's journal, this three-year journal, Flex of Gold, that reminds you it's the accumulation of those tiny little flecks of gold that make it worth it. Not, you're not going to, we're not going to very often find big nuggets. It, we're going to have to be happy with the teeny tiny little flecks, but that brings us happiness. And meditation, it really does help you to learn how to pause and regroup and move forward. And that helps you to not be so overwhelmed. This has been good. This has been such a good discussion. And I did learn how to get my stuff edited. I might have a couple questions and Linnell has offered to help me. So I hopefully during Christmas time, I'll be able to gift you the um, uploading of three months worth of recordings of our discussions and get caught up on YouTube so that we have that again. I love this, Rachel. My friend reads every afternoon for her own pleasure. Her kids have reading time at the same time also. That's what we did. It was so nice. And it, was, it fed my soul. Okay, moms, this has been wonderful. We're going to break for Christmas and for New Year's. And then we'll be back again that next week after New Year's. So that's what, um, the 7th? I don't know. But right around, I think it's the 7th. But and then we're going to turn the time over to Linnell for our summary of today's discussion. Yes, Merry Christmas to all of you. Go ahead, Linnell. Thanks. Thank you, Lori, for being inspired to know what to share. I appreciate the time that you take to prayerfully consider what you should share, because I think this topic of bedtime routine has touched all of us. And... I've known for a while that bedtime is supposed to be a golden hour. And so I've tried to work for that ideal and I have been met with so much opposition. It's so hard. And I can relate to each of the moms who have shared about how hard it is to get our kids to sleep. And also what Kira was saying, where we just need time to decompress and we just want time for ourselves because it's been a hard day or a long day and we just need a break. And I thought once, how sad would that be if my Heavenly Father told me, I just need a break from you, just leave. And as hard as that sounds and as hard as that feels, that's what I was doing to my children. And so it's actually like all of the things that Lori was reading is kind of like piercing my heart because I know that I need to get better on this, that I am that mom who wants my kids to, to be quiet or go to sleep or stay in your bed. But I appreciate the inspiration and the encouragement and the hope that I hear from moms who have figured this out. And Lori, that story you shared about Michael the night before his mission is so sweet. And that will stay with me for a while. And I will work for that. And even as, and especially on those days that are so difficult and I just need a break. I, it, I will remember that and I will think, no, I can do this. I can create that moment for my children because when I want to go to my heavenly father, I want him to say, sure, anytime, come be with me, stay with me. And I'm always striving to create that type of love and acceptance and peace for my own children. And so I will work towards that and continue to overcome whatever struggles that I have to be able to create that ideal for them because I do think it can be a really peaceful, not peaceful, it's, it's um, I don't know, it's a, it's a powerful time to connect with your children. I wanted to share a few mm, gems from page 252 and 253 of the Catch the Vision um, book, the intro course. And then I have a poem to share to end with. These are really powerful snippets. They're just things to think about, things to consider. Kind of disconnected thoughts, but really good. So I'll just share some of them. If sunrise could be witnessed, but once a year, who would be abed in the morning of that more than imperial pageant? Yet it is, yet is the splendor less because almost every day it streams along the sky. Think about that. We don't care so much about the sunrise because it happens every day, but that doesn't take away the beauty. 
and the magnificence of a sunrise. The fault of spiritual poverty is in ourselves, not in our surroundings. That gives us a lot to think about, huh? The heavens by day or, sorry, the heavens by night or day are as beautiful, grand, and sacred over the humblest home in America as over the greatest gallery or cathedral in Europe. And he who cannot find the treasures of life here will discover no treasures there. It doesn't matter where we are or what our circumstances are. There is beauty all around us. Um, at school or college, at the handles of the plow, or with a hoe in the fist, at the carpenter's bin or the bricklayer's scaffold, in the blacksmith's shop, behind the tradesman's counter, in the merchant's office, in the wife's and mother's round of ceaseless toil and care, wherever our appointed task is to be done, and woe to him who has not found his task or shrinks from doing it, there must the secrets of the world be learned and the power gained by use of which we enter into and possess the state of the soul. These are really deep. There's a lot to think about in these. So you can go back and, and read them, page 252 and 253. There's a few more I want to share. We are so immersed in the life of the senses, so cheated by the show of things, occupied by greetings in the marketplace, trifles in the street, fashions of dress. We give such time and attention to gossip of newspapers and society that the eye becomes dull and we see not, the ear heavy and we hear not and the soul forgets its nobleness, is defrauded of its heritage. We delude ourselves that happiness is to be found and only found at the winning post of life's race. And just maybe one or two I want to read. What power is found in books? A well-chosen library, though small and inexpensive, may introduce us to the best company the world has known. Bring us upon terms of intimacy with the kingly spirits of our race, Admit us to their confidence so that they tell us the secrets of their hearts. Show us the weapons with which they conquered the world and themselves. Breathe upon us the spirit of their courage, enthusiasm, faith, hope, and love. Teach us the secret of their nobleness, heroism, divinity, until in the rapt communion we grow into their manners, aims, achievements, and make them our own. There's so many more. So you can go and, and read these, but there's they, those are really deep to think about and consider. I think of, I think Lindsay, you were talking about over um, changing out your dining room and putting books and look at the power that you have in books by just bringing books to our homes and making a comfy space like Lori was saying. I really liked this thought of what am I feeding my soul before bedtime? If I need to create a magical time, maybe not magical, just a tender time for my children at bedtime, Am I creating a tender time at bedtime? Do I feel that way? Uh, so often I turn to social media or scroll and see what other people are posting. And I don't think that's filling my heart. That's given me something to think about. What should I be reading or pick, um, I don't know, consuming before I go to bed? I have one just poem to end with that I really liked. It was a sweet poem that we read today. It's called God is Like This, and it's from this Children's Hour book, the series. It's book five on page 269. It says, God is like this. I cannot see the wind at all or hold it in my hand. And yet I know there is a wind because it swirls the sand. I know there is a wondrous wind because I glimpse its power whenever it bends low a tree or sways the smallest flower. And God is very much like this, invisible as air. I cannot touch or see him, yet I know that he is there. Because I glimpse his wondrous works and goodness everywhere. Mama, mm -hmm. remember the poem that I read to you that is called My Gift? Yes, I shared that with them last, a couple weeks ago. This poem about God and how we can see him, I think, perfectly wraps up the things we've talked about that we as mothers try really hard to help our children, to bless them, to share with them our gifts. And sometimes we can't see the effect of our efforts. Sometimes we can't see God near us, but we can always feel him and we can always see it, the evidence of him working in our lives. And I know that our children can feel the same as we focus on 
trying to become our best selves and nurturing our hearts. They can't help but feel our love for them and recognize our efforts and, and it blesses their lives as well. Thank you. Those were so beautiful, all those quotes. My goodness, I remember the days when I used to type up quotes and have them written uh, and have them posted all around my house just because I felt like I needed to have positive messages or reminders all around me. So um, I love that. I love that we have access to so much goodness. And thank you for sharing a poem too. Um, Mom, thanks for being here. This was really good. I appreciate all of you so very much. And um, as Melissa shared, we, we've got another story after the recording ends. So if anybody wants to stay around for that, um, you, you're more than welcome to do that. But thanks for being here and have a very, very Merry Christmas.